Hello, and welcome to the Rejuvenation Roundup podcast, where we explore the latest in life extension and anti-aging science with a dive into a month's worth of insights and new breakthroughs. This podcast is a combined effort of the Lifespan Extension Advocacy Foundation, which operates Lifespan.io, and Future Grind, a podcast that explores the ethics and impact of emerging science and technology. February might be the shortest month, but it's still full of exciting research on the path towards ending age-related diseases. Let's take a look at the latest updates. Starting off with our research roundup. In a new paper, scientists from Yale University described the first controlled caloric restriction trial in humans. The study, known as Comprehensive Assessment of Long-Term Effects of Reducing Intake of Energy or Calorie, featured around 200 participants who were divided into a study group and a control group. Those in the study group were asked to reduce their calorie intake by about 14% for the two-year duration of the study. Since it is much harder to measure lifespan in humans, who thankfully are pretty long-lived species, researchers have to use various proxies. In this case, the authors started with analyzing thymic function. The results showed increased thymic mass and volume in the study group, while in the control group, no change was detected. The number of cells that had been recently produced by the thymus was increased and participants experienced a reduction of fat mass. When analyzing the impact of caloric restriction on gene expression in fat, the researchers found that it did alter the adipose tissue transcriptome, with 233 genes upregulated and 131 downregulated compared to the control group. Interestingly, this change happened during the first year of the study, and then the transcriptome stabilized, with no changes detected during the second half of the study. This reprogramming included pathways that are known to regulate the production of energy by mitochondria, anti-inflammatory responses, and longevity. The researchers also discovered a specific gene which was inhibited by caloric restriction, and this may be responsible for some of the diet's benefits. In a study published in Nature Aging, A group of scientists has shown that NAD levels are correlated not only with age but with physical activity, with elder athletes rivaling normal young adults. NAD levels are known to decline with age, and this decline has been linked to multiple age-related diseases. In animal models, NAD supplementation has been shown to provide health benefits, although the science is less clear regarding its effect on lifespan. This new study analyzes what happens with NAD in our muscles as we age. The researchers recruited 52 people, dividing them into four groups. 12 young people aged 20 to 30 and three groups of people aged 65 to 80. The first group in this age cohort reported normal levels of physical activity. The second group had above average levels of physical activity and the final group was categorized as physically impaired with abnormally low physical activity levels. The scientists then conducted a deep metabolomic analysis, recording the levels of more than a hundred various metabolites. They found that NAD was among the metabolites most downregulated with aging. Not only were levels correlated with aging, they also depended on the amount of physical activity. While there was a considerable difference in levels between the young adults and the normally active older adults, above average active older adults were almost on par with the young group. The physically impaired older adults fared the worst, with the lowest levels of NAD recorded. By showing the correlation between NAD levels and physical activity, this study suggests that exercise may be an effective way to boost your levels. Recent research, published in Diabetes, has implicated senescent cardiac stem cells as the link between diabetes and cardiovascular disease. Type 2 diabetes mellitus is closely related to aging. Aging is a major risk factor for diabetes, and individuals with diabetes exhibit several characteristics of accelerated aging. For example, diabetic patients show higher levels of systemic inflammation and oxidative stress than non-diabetic patients of the same age. They are also more prone to cardiovascular disease and exhibit impaired tissue regeneration. Senescent cells also accumulate in greater numbers in diabetic patients. Even in the absence of diabetes, senescent cells have been shown to contribute to systemic inflammation, oxidative stress, cardiovascular disease, and impaired tissue regeneration. A multi-center collaboration based out of Italy has recently found evidence to support the theory that diabetes-induced cellular senescence may be responsible for the cardiac degeneration effects seen in diabetic patients. 
The researchers used heart tissue samples from 50 to 64-year-old patients with and without type 2 diabetes. Tissue was collected during heart surgery from patients who had recently experienced heart attacks. Tissue from diabetic patients showed higher rates of oxidative stress, reduced telomerase activity and telomere length, and an increase in senescent cells. Cardiac stem cells that were isolated and cultured from diabetic patients also had reduced proliferation. Senescence was induced in the non-diabetic control cells when cultured in a high-glucose condition, which roughly simulates diabetes. However, treating the cardiac stem cells from diabetic patients with the senolytic stacitinib and quercetin successfully cleared the senescent cardiac stem cells and improved their ability to proliferate and differentiate in vitro. This study provides a mountain of evidence to suggest that the senescence of cardiac stem cells contributes to heart pathology in diabetic patients. As senolytic treatments move towards the clinic, it will be exciting to see their potential for treating diabetes-related cardiovascular disease. That's it for our research roundup. You can find more on these and other stories on our website at lifespan.io forward slash roundup. Some more videos from our Ending Age-Related Diseases conference have been released, including one of Irina Convoy discussing the effects of plasma dilution in heterochronic plasma exchange, and another featuring Greg Fay providing updates on the TRIM-X trial focused on thymus regeneration. We had a huge announcement this month. The popular edutainment YouTube channel LifeNoggin, which has over 3 million subscribers, has joined the Lifespan family. To celebrate the official launch, we released a new episode of Life Noggin that focuses on some unexpected sources of life extension that we interact with every day. Hey there, welcome to Life Noggin. You may not realize it, but there are many devices you interact with every day that are actually helping you to live longer. Number one is the toothbrush. While it's keeping your teeth nice and healthy and your breath fresh, this everyday device can also help your heart by lowering your risk of cardiovascular disease, which is the leading cause of death worldwide. It may not be able to prevent it, but studies have found that people who rarely brush their teeth were more likely to have high cholesterol or cardiac events like a heart attack or stroke. But brushing three or more times a day can lead to a 12% reduction in heart failure risk. The reason is still being investigated, but researchers theorize that by reducing the bacteria in your gum line, less bacteria enters the bloodstream where it can cause heart problems. Number two, toilets. See what we did there? Another common life extension device that we should all be using regularly is the toilet. By flushing away our sh uh, waste, we are avoiding serious health and safety risks. Without toilets, infected waste can contaminate our land and water, resulting in the spread of illnesses like cholera, typhoid, and diarrhea, which can be fatal if not treated. Sadly, 2.5 billion people don't have access to safe, clean toilets, and in those areas, diarrhea is the second leading cause of death for children under 5. Number three on the unexpected life extension devices list is the air conditioner. The air conditioner is another device that may not get all the respect it deserves. While it may seem like a luxury, it can actually save lives by keeping your body temperature low on really hot days. Medical experts say that air conditioning is the strongest protective factor against heat-related illness and the most effective way to cool down. This can prevent illnesses like heat stroke, which can be fatal. In fact, one study found that since air conditioners became common in the US in the 60s, the chances of dying on extremely hot days dropped by 75%. The final device I want to mention isn't in your house, but you probably use it every day. Every year, satellites save countless lives by doing a whole lot more than just forecasting the weather. They are also an essential tool in helping us manage natural disasters as they are happening, to locate areas that are at risk of flooding, fires or landslides, and even to predict earthquakes before they occur. They are even used in search and rescue missions, helping officials to precisely locate people lost at sea. So next time you brush your teeth or go to the bathroom, take a moment to appreciate the objects in your life that are helping you to live longer healthier lives. So I tease at the beginning of the video of a special announcement, and I'm excited to let everyone know that Life Noggin has officially become part of the team at the charity Lifespan.io, which is doing incredible work to fight age-related diseases like Alzheimer's, heart disease, and cancer by addressing the root causes of the aging process directly. 
You can check them out at youtube.com slash lifespan IO and lifespan news. They've helped us make a few videos in the past and really believe in what life noggin is trying to do. Our content isn't changing. The channel is staying life noggin. We basically just have a few more people to help us make more things. So I don't burn out again. We're going to be able to make more life noggin IRL VR videos and more incredible things that the animated lawyers are saying that I can't mention yet. I can't wait to see all the fun projects that'll start because of this Lifespan charity partnership, and I'm thankful that Life Noggin can continue making videos to help you learn new things. That's it. I told you it was good news. Make sure to subscribe to Life Noggin on YouTube for more educational content. Meanwhile, Science to Save the World has released a video discussing the organization METI, which stands for Messaging Extraterrestrial Intelligence. This group has been sending messages to space in hopes of contacting alien life. You can find this video and others on the Science to Save the World YouTube channel and Facebook page. New episodes of Lifespan News have also been released. In one of them, host Ryan O'Shea focuses on Dr. Morgan Levine's promotion of rejuvenation biotechnology on Wired, a media company historically associated with their coverage of the digital revolution. Here's some of that. Wired has released a video on the science of slowing down aging featuring Dr. Morgan Levine. The video has amassed well over half a million views in two weeks, performing better than many of the other videos on their channel. And this comes on the heels of another series, On the Future of Aging, released by Wired UK. Is this a sign of a growing interest in the science of longevity? And can we expect more content on this subject? We'll explore the possibilities in this episode of Lifespan News. Dr. Morgan Levine just recently announced that she would be leaving her position at Yale, where she served as an assistant professor in the Yale School of Medicine and founder of the Laboratory for Aging and Living Systems to take a position as founding principal investigator of Altos Labs, the cellular reprogramming-focused startup that just exited stealth mode with $3 billion in funding, reportedly from investors including Jeff Bezos. Wired actually released two videos featuring Dr. Levine within a small window. In the first video, an episode of their ongoing series Tech Support, she spent 17 minutes answering aging-related questions from Twitter. In the second video, she provided a general overview of concepts that are often discussed within the longevity community, but might be unknown to those outside of it, such as the difference between chronological age and biological age, senescent cells and senolytics, the hallmarks of aging, aging clocks, and blue zones. If you want more in-depth explanations on any of these topics, we've linked to some of our past content on them in the video description. The reactions to these Dr. Levine videos was largely positive, which isn't always the case when proponents of longevity are featured in media that predominantly reaches an audience outside of the core community. Reaction was also positive to Wired UK's videos on longevity, which have been viewed far fewer times than the Levine videos, but still received a warm reception. It seems clear that there are audiences that are interested in and will support this type of content, and it's great to see an outlet such as Wired getting into this. Wired was created in the early 1990s, when co-founders Louis Rossetto and Jane Metcalf decided to make a consumer magazine version of Electric Word, a technology magazine that they were involved with that was popular among academics and industry insiders. Wired sought to be the rolling stone of cutting-edge technology, and they were on the forefront of covering the digital revolution. Ownership has changed since then, and the company has certainly branched out into featuring more celebrities and pop culture content in addition to its original tech-heavy focus. But the fact that a publication that built its success on identifying and capitalizing on emerging trends and industries is now creating content on life extension and receiving positive feedback is a great sign. And that original Wired co-founder, Jane Metcalf is following a similar path. She started another publication, NeoLife, which seeks to do for the neobiological revolution what Wired did for the digital revolution. I had the opportunity to speak with Jane on an episode of the Future Grind podcast, and here's how she explained it to me. NeoLife is very inspired by Wired um, because I realized at a certain moment that what I was experiencing in and curious about had so many similar feelings to what I was experiencing in the 80s prior to the run up of the digital revolution. And, you know, what happened was I became very interested in health for a variety of reasons. I'd had my own struggles with health 
but when my parents started to experience cognitive decline as well as uh, breakdown in mental health. So I started just researching, you know, what, what can I do to help my parents? What I discovered was how technology has just blown up what is happening in the health sphere and in biology, you know, and life sciences writ large. And I met people at the forefront of genetics and neuroscience and longevity studies and the microbiome. And, you know, they all had the same story, which is, you know, for years I've been interested in this, but it wasn't until advanced imaging came along or big data or machine learning or 3D printing or neurostimulation, you know, or whatever the technology was that suddenly unlocked this ability to see and understand the biological systems they were working with so much better. You know, when I was at these conferences, I was realizing I used to think that computer engineers were the most powerful people in the world. But then I met these MDs and PhDs who, in addition to their digital skills, had, you know, 15 years of deep learning about, you know, the very complex biological systems that they have to work within. And, you know, with these tools, that's even more powerful because now we're actually altering evolution. And so to me, it felt extremely similar. And yet same tool, sort of like it's this is the next phase of the digital revolution. The bottom line is we're talking about the difference between life and death. And so the risk reward ratio is quite different. So it seems that one of the original founders of Wired, as well as its current leadership, which built their brands on the digital revolution, are now turning at least some of their attention to the biological revolution. And I don't blame them because this is going to be the next big thing. Expect to see more life extension content in larger, more pop culture and mainstream outlets. That's a sign of the success that we are having as a community and of the growing interest in this topic. If you want more of this, and perhaps deeper dives than you're likely to get from some of the other outlets, make sure to subscribe here. I'm Ryan O'Shea, and we'll see you next time on Lifespan News. Another new episode of Lifespan News focuses on a recent controversy involving whether or not the well-known supplement resveratrol is effective at extending life, or if it could actually be harmful. You can find the episode on YouTube at youtube.com forward slash Lifespan News. That's it for this episode of the Rejuvenation Roundup podcast. Thank you very much for spending another month with us and for your help in the fight against age-related diseases. Whether you're donating, spreading the word, or simply listening to our content, we appreciate your help. Remember to subscribe, leave a review, and post about us on social media. This will increase our reach and introduce more people to the importance of life extension science. Don't forget, you can get additional deep dives into science, technology, and futurism on the Future Grind podcast. Find out more at futuregrind.org. Thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you next time on the Rejuvenation Roundup podcast.